After a long summer of negotiations, the Cleveland Cavaliers have finally signed Isaac Okoro to a three-year, $38 million deal. Overall, I think this was a solid move with a lot of benefits, but there are also some questions and concerns that I'm going to bring up later in the video. For now, let's start with the positives. Okoro is one of the best backcourt defenders in the NBA who has just enough size to scale up and defend wings if you need him to. Listen, it's not ideal to have Okoro defending someone like Paolo Bancaro, but we saw last year that even with that height disadvantage, Okoro can make a difference with his physicality. He might actually be the most physical defender on the Cavs, and Okoro was able to force Bancaro into some incredibly difficult shot attempts during that series, making him work for every bucket. And so I think Okoro's contributions on defense can often go overlooked because he's playing next to both Evan Mobley and Jared Allen but his worth as a point of attack defender who can scale up and make a difference against larger opponents is truly important. Since defense has been their calling card, the Cavs have relied on Okoro more than you'd probably think over the last few years, and so I was always on board with bringing him back to Cleveland, but let's take a look at this deal and what it actually means. So Okoro's new contract puts him at roughly $12 million a year for the next three seasons. That's right on par with a group of players who I would say are in the same tier as Okoro. If you look down this list, I think you can make a genuine case that Okoro is one of the best, if not the best player in this group, and you can argue that he still has higher potential than anyone else on that list as well. So from that perspective, I don't really see why anyone would be overly upset at this deal. Okoro's floor is within an acceptable range of the players who make a comparable salary, and his ceiling is high enough to make this a legit bargain deal if everything plays to the best case scenario. And I want to talk more about Okoro's ceiling in a minute because that's a key component here, but let's finish recapping the details of this contract first. So obviously, it took all summer for this deal to be completed, and it's because the Cavs are desperately trying to avoid hitting that first apron or really even delving into the luxury tax. They've given max contracts to Evan Mobley and Donovan Mitchell, as well as extending Jared Allen and the pre-existing max contract to Darius Garland, so the Cavs are walking a tightrope financially, and that's why I think it's important to note that Aquaro's salary does not push the Cavs into the first apron but it does put them slightly into the luxury tax, which could be a red flag for the front office. I'm not predicting anything, but I would just say watch out for a potential move that aims to cut salaries somewhere else on this roster. I won't say what that move would be, I just think the Cavs might not be totally finished making moves if staying out of the tax is their goal, which I think we can reasonably believe that's something they want to do. They might look to dump salaries somewhere else if it becomes possible. And then finally, I think it's worth mentioning that Okoro could have signed an $11.8 million qualifying offer to return to the Cavs this season and then use next summer to test his market in unrestricted free agency, but he instead agreed to take the long-term security and remain with the franchise. This is a signal of commitment and it's been a theme for the Cavs this summer. They have locked themselves into long-term deals with this group and that's why some people are concerned, especially in the case of Okoro. I think it's pretty obvious why someone might be a little worried. If you've watched Okoro play basketball, then anyone can see that he isn't the most respected three-point shooter in the association, which isn't ideal when you're playing in a league that prioritizes three-point shooting basically above all else. There's a term open for a reason, and Okoro definitely falls into that category. Throughout the regular season, he might draw a bit more attention, but once the playoffs start, we have seen that for two years in a row, opponents will completely ignore Koro and dare him to knock down three-point shots at an efficient rate. And so all things considered, I do think Okoro has developed into a pretty decent shooter, but his growth in the regular season just hasn't translated to the playoffs yet. Okoro was shooting a respectable 37% on his last 500 three-point attempts during the regular season, but he's shooting just 13 of 48, 27% in the playoffs, and that simply won't cut it. Now, if I'm being optimistic and I'm trying to put some spin on this, I'd say that's a very small sample size in the playoffs that would look drastically different with just a few changes. For example, if Okoro had just made five more of those attempts, he would be right back up to 37%, so I do think there's a grain of salt worth considering here. But at the end of the day, the playoffs are all that matter, and Okoro likely cost himself a big payday by struggling offensively. If anyone has concerns over the offensive limitations we have seen entering year 5 for Okoro, then I totally understand that. 
Okoro has sunk for two years in a row in the playoffs, and he doesn't bring enough as a playmaker or a ball handler to make up for his lack of shooting offensively. If the end result is Okoro flat out can't be trusted in the playoffs, then this contract would admittedly be a disaster. And so again, I understand why taking this risk could make some Cavs fans uneasy. But here's the deal, I'm not going to beat you over the head with Okoro's defensive capabilities because I think we can all see his value on that end of the floor, and there's potential for him to get even better as a defender as he gains experience. And then as for his offense, I do feel encouraged by Okoro's growth as a three-point shooter in the regular season because it felt like we were a massive leap away from Okoro even being a competent threat when he shot just 27% from deep as a rookie. Back then, it was hard to imagine he would ever get to where he is right now. But now, three full seasons later, he's managed to narrow that gap quite a bit to the point where he doesn't even really need to make a leap per se, but more of a lunge or just a big step forward. He's gone from horrible to average, and so one more step could take him to where the Cavs need him to be. He's really not that far away at this point, and so my hope is that Okoro will start attempting somewhere near 4-5 to five three point attempts per game while staying above 35%, and if he's able to do that, then this deal will pay for itself. But more importantly, can he be trusted to hit big shots when opponents leave him open in the playoffs? For me, that's the big question with Okoro, is he capable of hitting those backbreakers when teams dare him to, or is he going to shy away from the moment? This is where Okoro has to prove a few things in order for all of this to make sense. Again, personally, I feel comfortable taking this bet because I do believe in his current trajectory. I don't see Okoro being a star at any point, but he's definitely on track to be a very valuable role player, and this contract reflects that value. The last point I want to make is that some people continue to use Okoro's draft position as a reason to feel angry, and I just think it's time to readjust our expectations. The draft isn't a zero-sum game. Just because someone like Tyrese Halliburton was selected later in the lottery doesn't mean that Okoro's production is worth nothing. This is where we are now, and the path forward is clear for Okoro. He must continue to be an elite defender and command enough respect as a three-point shooter to stay on the floor in key moments. There's obviously a little bit more to that, and so I plan on having full season previews for most Cavs players before the season starts, so I will be going more in-depth on Okoro soon, but for now, that's the goal. So again, I'm happy with this contract, but please feel free to let me know in the comments what you think. Was this an overpay? Do you believe in Okoro's development? And do you think the Cavs will look to dump some salary elsewhere to avoid being in the luxury tax? Please share your thoughts in the comments, and if you like this video, then you know the drill by now. Hit subscribe, drop a like, and follow me on Twitter. Your support is very much appreciated, and with all that being said, go Cavs!